periodic table is 6.94U. That's the average, the weighted average, we call it. And it would be the weighted average of all isotopes. Lithium has two natural isotopes um, with atomic masses of 6.10512 and 7.01600U. Calculate the percentage distribution between the two isotopes. So what we need to know is we need to know the um, percent uh, lithium-6. How do I know that this one's lithium-6? Well, when I look at the actual mass, it's close to 6. And so if I have 6 protons and neutrons, it's going to come out close to 6U. So that's how I know that one. And this one's going to be percent lithium-7. So um, we don't know X, and we don't know Y. And so this is a, what we call um, a 2 unknown problem. When we have two unknowns, um, how do we solve it? Well, there are different methods we could use to solve it. I'll show you another method. Actually, when there's only two unknowns, there's a simple method for solving this, which, which I like to do. Um, one way of solving this is by using um, two equations and two unknowns. Two equations for two unknowns. <clears throat> but we, be, we get hit with a lot of these problems. So as we get hit with a lot of these problems, I think there's a simpler way of solving it because this involves a lot of algebraic manipulation. And so I think the simpler way of solving this is what I call the graphical method. The graphical method is not discussed in your book. So uh, the two equations for two unknowns, um, you've done that, right, in algebra? So what would the two equations be? So equation one would just be our a weighted average, you know. Our weighted average is going to be just equal to the, um, <clears throat> I'd like to con convert it into, uh, fractions. So I'll just say x percent lithium 6, and then we're going to convert it into a fraction by dividing it by 100 percent. The percents cancel out, and we get the fractional abundance of lithium 6 times the mass of lithium 6, 6.10512 U, plus the fractional abundance of lithium-7, which I'll call y percent lithium-7, divided by 100, because I want to convert it back into the fraction, 100 percent. And so the percents cancel, that gives me the <clears throat> fractional abundance of that, 7.0-1600. U. All right, uh, that's equation one. What's equation two? So we're going to have to come up with another equation for this. And the equation two is that all the isotopes have to add up to 100%. And so if there are only two isotopes, then those two isotopes need to add up to 100%. So if I take eight x percent plus y percent, that's going to give me 100%. Then all we do is we um, solve for one variable and substitute. It doesn't matter equation one or equation two. Probably equation two would be a lot easier. And so we solve for one variable and then substitute. So we could either solve for x or y. And then substitute in one. I'm not going to do that because th you've done this right before in, in algebra in math, correct? Except that probably it wasn't so messy. It was probably a lot cleaner in algebra. You didn't have all these 
long numbers to deal with. They give us the weighted average. There would be three unknowns if we didn't have the weighted average. The weighted average is 6.94U. So we know the first equation is equal to 6.94U. Et cetera. So I'm just going to say et cetera. Okay. Now, for two component mixtures, we have a very simple way of doing this graphically. I already showed this to you visually. <clears throat> visually, I showed this to you in this way for chlorine. There are two isotopes for chlorine. One isotope is 35, the other isotope is 37. If it were 50% 35, then what is the percent 37? 50%. If it's 75% 35, then what percent 37 is it? 25. And so that's what we do here. I just send up a, a simple number scale. And so this is the graphical method, quite simplified. Let's say I'm going to go with 100% 37. That means if I have 100% 37, what is my percent 35? And what is my percent 37? And how much does it weigh? How much do the atoms weigh? About 37. That The average, in other words, what would the average be? Closer to 35 or closer to 37? It'd be closer to 37. In fact, it would be, it would be if it's 100% 37, it would be 37, correct? All right, now we do this. That's called an assumption. So we assume it's 100% 37, and the average is 37. Then we're going to take the opposite assumption. We're going to assume it's 100% 35. And so therefore, I'm going to get 100% 35. And what's my percent 37? Zero percent. And what's the average? The average is 35. So these are the two limits at the extreme. And then what I do is I just visualize this graphically. Scientists love to graph things. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph this. I'm going to graph this in terms of percent 37. If I have 100 percent 37, what is the average? The average is 37, correct? If I have 100% 35, what is the average? 35. So I have two lines. Now this re relationship should be linear. As the 37 decreases, the 35 increases, and as the 35 increases, the 37 in decreases. So it's a linear seesaw relationship. We call the linear re seesaw relationship uh, a straight line relationship. A straight line relationship is, we could draw it like this. Oops, did I forget to unlock that? So what we end up with is um, a graph like this. Now, we can simplify this graph into a mathematical equation. So let's reduce this graph into a, the most concise definition we can um, generate. And what would that be? That would be y, which is the percent. Actually, what is it? y is the average mass. So y is the average mass, which we call the average atomic mass, or just the atomic mass. People just forego the average and just call it the atomic mass. The atomic mass is equal to the slope. What is the slope? Delta y, which is going to be 2u 
over delta x, which is going to be 100 percent, times the percent 37. So uh, what did I call that? I called that y percent 37, or this is x now, x percent 37. And so this will be chlorine 37, plus the intercept. The intercept is 35u, whatever that is. And so we come up with an equation like this. And so um, either we plug in the average atomic mass and calculate the percent chlorine 37, or we plug in the percent chlorine 37 and then calculate the average atomic mass. This works for mixtures of two. So this is what I did yesterday, but I just did it in my head. I did it in my head because I said, well, if it's 50%, it would be 36. If it's 25%, it's going to be 35.5. If it's 75%, it's going to be 36.5. So I just I just look, looked at this in my head and then figured that if the average is 35 and a half, it's got to be 25% 37, 75% 35. And so that's what I was doing when I was looking at the number line. Or you could just look at the number line and then um, write it here, which I did on the board yesterday. I didn't draw a graph yesterday. For this one, I'll, I'll just draw a graph. And so rather than doing this, which is more algebra than I want to do, I think this is less algebra. And so for the lithium problem, I'm going to do this. I'm going to assume 100% lithium-6. If I assume 100% lithium-6, then what's the average mass? The atomic mass would be 6.5. Ten, five, twelve, and then we make the opposite assumption, and next, forget this and assume one hundred percent lithium seven, and that comes out to seven point. Oh, 1600. And then I graph it. So I graph it based on the heavier one. So I'm going to put percent lithium 7 here, which is the heavier one, and I'll go 100%. This will give me a positive slope because if I'm at 100% lithium 7, I'm going to have an average mass of 7.01600U. And then if I'm at 0% lithium-7, then I must be at 100% lithium-6, which is going to give me a mass of 6.10512. And then I just draw a line and assume it's a linear relationship. And then I could figure out the equation for the line, y equals mx plus b, where y is the atomic mass. M is the slope. And so that's going to be um, 7.01600u minus 6.10512u. How many decimal places am I allowed in the subtraction? So one, two, three, four, five, five decimal places here. One, two, three, four, five decimal places here. So in the answer in the numerator, I'm allowed five decimal places. So let's go ahead and, and calculate that to five decimal places. <clears throat> So I have 7.016 minus 6.10512. Let me do that again. 6.10512. I have a screen protector, so it's always not registering. 0.91015. That's five, and then the six would be a zero. This is going to be U. If I were to 
carry a six. So I, I had six sig figs here, six sig figs here, but my final answer is only going to have five sig figs. Oops, I'm not quite done yet. <clears throat> I need to clear out a little bit of space here. Okay, then delta x is easy. What is delta x? So this is my slope. I screwed this up for space. I don't have enough space here. And I, ran, I just ran out of pages. Yeah, unfortunately, my word is about to crash. I have to delete that, unfortunately. Sure. Keep the report sheets uh, nice and neat. Uh, normally, um, the reports, these are meant to be given, you know, given to people to read or given to instructors to grade. And so you want to make sure the reports leave a positive impression. So if you're going to make a bunch of mistakes, um, the best place to make mistakes are not on the report sheet. The best place to make mistakes are in your lab notebook. You know, it doesn't matter if you make tons of mistakes. There are, there are scratches out, but you want to keep the report sheets clean. This is, this is the reason why you want to write your initial data in your um, lab notebook. If you forget your lab notebook, then just do it on loose leaf paper and then either tape it or staple it or glue it into your lab notebook. That way you have a permanent record. 
The other thing about report sheets, the reports are meant to be given away. You know, they aren't always meant to be returned. So if you're given a report, you make multiple copies and give it away. But what some people do is they, they give away their original data. If you give away your original data, then you don't have anything um, to actually, you don't have anything to um, show um, that you did the experiment. So for example, if you need to write another report and you don't have the original data, it's going to be very difficult um, to do. And so what you end up having to do is, is to repeat the experiment. And even when you do write your original observations in your notebook, sometimes, you know, you're in a rush. You don't write that much. And so there are cases where I had to go back because some, sometimes there's a long delay between when you do the experiment and when you actually write the report. And uh, during that long delay, I, I forgot completely what I did in the experiment. So I went back into my notebook and then started reading. And I still couldn't figure out what I did in the experiment. So I had to redo the the whole series of experiments because I just didn't take enough observations to figure out what was going on. And so at the bare minimum, you need enough observations so that you can understand you know, after a couple of years <coughs> what you actually did and, and what the results of the experiment were. The um, reports, you know, since you have the permanent data, the permanent data you want to make as permanent as possible. So in the notebook, you have to write with ink. But that's not a problem because if you make a mistake, you can just cross it out. Never rip out pages because if you rip out pages, then people begin to suspect the, uh, the data. And so you just exit out. You don't have to scribble it out so it's illegible. You usually exit out so you can see what the mistake was originally. For reports, you don't have to do these in ink. You can do these in pencil. So if you make a mistake, you just erase it and uh, rewrite it. And so pencil's fine for reports. But let's uh, look at some of the questions on the report. Um, this is questions for the Bunsen burner. Why should the match be lighted before turning on the gas? Now, does somebody want to volunteer an answer for that? Now, what was that? Right. To, you don't want too much gas to leak out into the room. It creates an explosion or fire hazard. And so uh, you light the match first and then turn on the gas to minimize the amount of gas that escapes into the room. Because if you do this and you have trouble lighting the match, then the room's filling up with gas. And it's potentially explosive. So we do that to minimize the amount of gas leaked into the room. Explosion or fire hazard. Two, this is what you're going to turn in. And so um, might as well turn it in today. It's if you can. Why must the methane be mixed with air in the barrel before it is burned? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's going to come out yellow. Uh, we have to get the right mixture of uh, fuel and air. We call this the fuel-air ratio or the air to fuel ratio. And it's got to be right. You know, too little air and you have unburnt. We could have unburnt methane. That was another possibility. Or carbon monoxide or soot. Too much air is a potentially a problem too because too much air could blow out the flame. So we, we've got to mix the uh, air in the barrel before it is burned to get the right what we call stoichiometric mixture. We'll talk about stoichiometry in the next chapter, um, yeah, chapter 7. What is the color of the flame when the air inlet holes are closed? Where are the air inlet holes located? At the bottom. How do you open and close the air inlet holes? I didn't realize not everybody knew this. So if you don't know this, you, you pay attention. How do you, how do you open? You yeah, you just twist the barrel. Um, you can twist it out, that'll open the holes. You twist it in, and that'll close the holes. That's how we get the right <clears throat> mixture. How do you know you have the right mixture? When the color is not yellow and, and you have a nice yeah, blue flame with a nice little 
cone. Yeah. And we now have we have a pretty good mixture. And so A. What is required to convert the cooler luminous flame? Luminous flame, because luminous means it, it just glows. And the cooler lu luminous flame is a yellow flame, even though you think yellow is not luminous, but the blue flame is, is non-luminous. Blue flame is hard to see. You know, with the lights on, it's almost kind of invisible. It's difficult to see. So this is why they call the, the yellow flame luminous, because it, kind of, it glows yellow. That's why it illuminates uh, yellow light. What is required to convert the cooler luminous flame to a hotter flame? What has? Or whoever? Oxygen. Air. More air. Good. OK, draw a, a diagram of the non-luminous flame. Using your results from the flint test, which is a match test, label the hottest and coolest parts of the flame. So what does your diagram of the flame look like? Um, so we could draw the top of the burner like this, and what would the flame look like? There's a cone in the middle, so we'll put the cone like this, maybe, the cone. And then this is enveloped by the rest of the flame, like something like this. So we have um, three parts you could think of. <clears throat> One part would be outside the cone here. Another part would be the surface of the cone. And then inside the cone. So what's happening is, um, you know, where the combustion is taking place, where we have that right ratio of air to fuel is not inside the cone. Inside the cone, is there any combustion taking place based on your observations? No. no. Right at the surface of the cone is where we got that max reaction. And so the surface of the cone is going to be the, the hottest, yeah. In fact, like the tip of the cone, people say, is the hottest. And so anywhere on the surface of the tip, here. And so if you're going to pick one spot, I'd just pick the tip of the cone as being the hottest. Where would be the coolest part of the flame? Outside. Hottest, is that right? <laughs> yeah. The outside, um, actually the outside is not the coolest. Yeah, the inside. This is just the gas. The gas hasn't been um, ignited yet. The gas ignites right at the surface here. So inside, this is unburned gases in here. And so it's not that hot. And then the medium part of the flame would be outside. This is for the temp.
What is the condensate that forms inside the beaker when it is held above the flame? Did I do that? Have you seen it? Okay, let's do that right now so I don't miss any parts of the... So I try to light the match first and then turn on the gas. Sometimes it fails to light, but then I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the beaker. Take a look at the beaker right now. Do you see it? Okay, now I'm going to hold it above here and then take a look at the beaker. Do you see it's fogging up? That's the condensate, that fog that's forming on the inside of the beaker. Once the beaker gets hot enough, the fog will evaporate. Let me get a cooler beaker here. But if the, if the beaker is somewhat cool, okay, so it's clear, and then I'll just hold it up here. Do you see some fog forming there? Condensate? What is that condensate? Do you know what it is? Well, <clears throat> what happens is, when methane and oxygen uh, react, what forms? And so this is one of the reactions that we saw. Oops. Just write it over here. So methane has a formula. Um, what? CH4. One carbon, four hydrogens. Is that fixed, the composition of methane? Yeah. Yeah, it's always CH4. Is it a solid, liquid, or gas? It's a gas. So we put a little G here and put parentheses. So subscript G, this means that methane's a gas. And then we react this with oxygen. Oxygen is, uh, what's the correct formula for oxygen? The oxygen in the air, O2. Is that a solid, liquid, or gas? It's a gas. And then this is going to go to, do you know what methane forms? When it combusts. Well, it can form soot, which we don't want. We had a nice blue flame, so it could form carbon monoxide, which we don't want. We want complete combustion, which means we're going to form what? I'm sorry? CHO? CHO, um, you might have heard CHO before. CHO is um, formaldehyde. It's actually CH2O is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is in the flame, but eventually it burns further to form what? So formaldehyde is one of the, the, the species. The flame is a complex, complex mixture. You'd think the flame was easy because how long has methane been around? It's been around a long time. How long have people been burning it? A long time. But it wasn't until fairly recent that people finally sorted it all out. You know, it's quite complicated. There are about 2,000 different species, um, or different paths, I should say paths, not species. There are lots and lots of species in the flame. They don't live for very long, so a little bit of formaldehyde forms and eventually it gets burnt all the way to what? Formaldehyde you can burn too. It gets burnt to what? This is, you know, uh, 
are you guys, um, this is the whole reason why there's a big push. You know, in California, they want to get rid of gasoline-powered cars by 2036, right? And so all new cars that are going to be sold in California are going to be um, electric. And the reason why they want to do this is because they're so um, concerned about this, the product of combustion. What is the product of combustion for this? <laughs> yeah, I'd be concerned about smoke. You know what I think would be much more effective environmentally wise? I think not to push everybody to go electric, but just to, to get rid of the old cars. If they can make new cars, new cars burn so much cleaner. Like if you have a car from the 1970s, a car from the 1980s, a car from the 1990s, that puts out like 100 to 10 times more pollution than a new car does. So if they can just get rid of some of the older cars by making cars more affordable rather than than doing that, that would clean up the air a lot, I think. Uh, things would burn up a lot more efficiently. And then the other thing is, um, if they just went to hybrid, hybrid are, are, they don't burn that much gasoline. I had a hybrid, um, and uh, I have an electric too, I have an electric car, but I had a hybrid. But you know, the hybrid was actually cheaper to drive than the electric. And it didn't use that much gas, so it didn't put out so much of this product. What is this product that people are worried about? Carbon dioxide. They're worried about CO2. And why are they worried about CO2? Because they're, they're concerned about global warming. Global warming. CO2 is a gas. And it, it traps in heat. His CO2 can vibrate in different ways and absorb heat, Infra infrared. But there's one more product of combustion. Do you know what that one more product of combustion is? It could be soot, but for clean combustion, methane burns very clean. So the thing is, OK, if we power by electricity, this is, um, I, don't, I don't know the calculations, and it would be good to do the calculations. I'd like to see the calculations. But most of our electricity, at least in California, we get from burning methane. And then uh, we burn methane, we drive the uh, whatever generators, convert it to electricity. And, and then when we convert it to electricity, do you think we <clears throat> convert it efficiently to electricity, that is, we use 100% of the energy involved in the combustion, and that converts it to 100% electricity. Do you think it's efficient? No. It's not that efficient. Energy is, uh, yeah, energy is another one, but there's one more product of combustion. Do you know what it is? So what do we have that we haven't um, reacted yet? Hydrogen. So it's, it could be hydrogen. Is hydrogen very stable? No. What's more stable? Hmm? What's that? I'm sorry, Spencer. H2. H2. H2 and methane are both very flammable, quite explosive. So if H2 were around in that flame, it would be gone. So if you take H2 and burn it, what do you think you form? If you take H2 and burn it, do you know what you form? Um, H2O. There's a, uh, there's a vi uh, video out there where there's a hydrogen. Have you ever seen a hydrogen-powered car? There's a hydrogen-powered car where the person sticks a beaker at the exhaust pipe and collects the condensate and then drinks it. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, because when you burn H2, it forms H2O. And so they were promoting hydrogen as an alternate fuel. Um, problem is, is like, as the cost of um, gasoline skyrocketed, so did the cost of hydrogen. And so Toyota, um, did I tell you I test drove their hydrogen-powered car? 
This is at the, um, you know, at uh, Manhattan Village. They had a, Toyota was there, and they're giving like $20 Simple Greens gift card if you test drove their Mirai. So I, I test drove their Mirai. So I figured that's, it's, it'd be worth 20 bucks. And it, it's just like an electric car. I mean, I don't know any, any difference, except the, it makes electricity by, essentially by burning hydrogen. It doesn't burn hydrogen in a flame. It, it does it by um, oxidizing it in a controlled fashion, so it doesn't create a flame. But it converts it to electricity and you use that. But the, the problem with hydrogen is the hydrogen cost has skyrocketed. Uh, you know, some, somebody was complaining to fill up their hydrogen car cost $200 and the range wasn't so far. And so it became cost prohibitive. Uh huh. The range is poor. What's that? The range. the range is poor also. Yeah. And so what we form here is when we have combustion of methane with oxygen, this is called oxidation. When we oxidize methane with oxygen, we form the oxides of carbon and the oxides of hydrogen. The oxides of carbon are CO2. There are, there are a number of different oxides of carbon. What are the other oxides of carbon? The other oxides of carbon are carbon monoxide and any others? Um, how about um, CO1.1? Is that an oxide of carbon? No. This is not. How about carbon um, with a 1.1257? One uh, no. We wouldn't have such weird ratios because that would um, violate what law? Um, not constant, because um, they could be different. We could have CO2 or we could have CO, but we aren't going to have these. Yeah, this is atomic theory, and this is the law of multiple proportions. This is, can I talk about the law of multiple proportions? Oh, yes, constant. Oh, constant, yeah. Constant. There's a law of constant composition, so your law is a hybrid of the two, I think. Constant composition and multiple proportions. How about CO3? Is that another oxide of carbon? Yes. CO3? Yes? Carbon trioxide. Have you ever heard? Um, are they worried about um, CO2 and CO3? Or are they worried about CO2? Or are they worried about what? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. L at least not stably. Well, it could exist as what we call a free radical then it would exist possibly or I don't know CO3 there's some there's a problem with CO3 you know it could exist as some exotic more exotic species but the the problem is is this we'll, we'll talk about it um, today so when you look at this um, we want to make sure that the Law of conservation of law of conservation of mass is obeyed. Would the law of conservation of mass be obeyed here? No. Why not? Okay, that would be conservation of mass and energy. I'm going to obey conservation of energy by saying that there's going to be some energy released here, plus energy. I ran out of space. Uh, 
Okay, I went out way outside the margin here. Now, a word has hung up. So how did you know the law wasn't obeyed here? Yeah, so what we have to do is we have to balance this. So let's go ahead and balance this. Balance means we gotta make sure that the atoms on the left are, are the same as the atoms on the right. So we have one carbon, one carbon. So the carbons are balanced, except we have four hydrogens over here. How many hydrogens do we have on the right? Two. And so what we need to do is we need to call this H4O. Should we call it H4O? We aren't going to call it H4O because what is H4O? Yeah, it's four hydrogen and one oxygen, but does it exist? No. So what we have to do in order to get it to balance is we have to have um, two of the water molecules rather than just one. And so what I do is I'll put a two in front of the H2O here. All right, my computer has crashed, I think. So uh, just give me a, a minute. Oh, it's still going. All right, so what am I missing here? All right, plus 2H2O. Plus energy. Yeah. We have two oxygens at the beginning and four oxygens at the end. Yeah, we're going to have to have two O2s. Now, how does that look? Better. All right, what was the state for CO2? The state is solid liquid gas. Gas. Now, what's the state of H2O? All right, initially it's a gas, but when it cools down, what does it do? It condenses back into a liquid. Is it going to stay hot forever in this room? No. So eventually it's going to cool back down to a liquid. When, when you vaporize water, it costs energy. So when you boil water, you have to add lots of energy to boil the water. But when water condenses, do you know what happens? 
it releases energy. And so what we want is we want the water to co condense back into a liquid to release all that energy so that we can add it to the sum total of the energy over here. And so this is what we're going to um, do. So I'll tell you the names for these here. The name for this one is most people memorize the common name. The common name is methane. But we also have a systematic way of naming this. The systematic name for this would be carbon tetra hydride. Hydride. Or there's another name for this one too. Tetrahydrogen carbide. Now, which one do we use depends on the order that the elements are written here. And so we typically use this one, carbon tetrahydride or tetrahydrogen carbide. We typically use the first one. Or carbon Roman numeral four hydride. or hydrogen carbide. And so what we want to do is we can name them using all of these, but we want to come up with a, with a name that everybody can use. And that name would be methane. You know what, um, as an alternative to methane, um, people are thinking about using ammonia. Have you heard of that? Ammonia. Um, that's ammonium. Ammonia would be NH3 as an alternate fuel. The reason why they're looking at ammonia is because of Because of carbon, everybody's worried about carbon. You know, we in California, we pay carbon tax, right? Do you know that? Because the methane, um, we pay a certain carbon tax to, we have to have a certain amount of green methane. Have you heard of that? Or green electricity. Our electricity, a lot of our electricity comes from burning methane. And since it's, it's considered dirty electricity, then we pay a carbon tax. We pay it in our electricity bill, this is the carbon tax. And so to, to avoid, the, I guess carbon is bad. So to avoid carbon, um, Toyota, I know, is looking at using ammonia. But the problem is, is when you burn ammonia with air, we're going to form not oxides of carbon. What are we going to form? Oxides of nitrogen. Oxides of nitrogen are called, um, well, there are lots of them. And so we call them NOx. NOx. Have you heard of NOx? Oxides of nitrogen? Diesel spit out a lot of NOx. But when you go, I, if you have a car, you know, what they call the ICE car, the internal combustion engine car, you have to take it for a smog check. So I took my a car uh, recently for a smog check and they check for NOx, oxides of nitrogen. Now it depends on how completely you combust it. You know, there are lots of different NOx. Some of them you, you might be familiar with. So for example, NO, NO.5. Now you think NO.5, is that a violation of what? Would that be a, a, a violation of the law of constant composition? Yeah. No, if the composition is fixed, it's not a violation of the law of composi cons constant composition. What is a violation of? 
law of multiple proportions because law of multiple proportions states that it's got to be in simple whole numbers because atoms, can you have half an atom of oxygen? No. But this is actually not NO.5. This is actually N2O. It just comes out the ratio, 1 to 0.5 or 2 to 1 ratio. N2O is um, maybe people wouldn't mind this because I think if, if you burn ammonia and out of the exhaust tailpipe comes N2O, then I think a lot of people would be happier because do you know what N2O is? N2O is called um, nitrous oxide. Have you heard of nitrous oxide? Yeah? What is it? Yeah, um, it's laughing gas. So I think if, if, you're, um, if your ammonia burning car is spitting out laughing gas, a lot of people would be laughing probably. Um, but the problem is, is that's not the only NOx. What are some other NOx that you can have? <laughs> yeah, permanently sleeping gas, like um, like this, N-O. No. And so we have different uh, oxides of nitrogen. Let me continue those here because we're talking about nomenclature now. And so laughing gas has a bunch of different names. Nitrous oxide, um, another name for this is dinitrogen monoxide. Another name for this is nitrogen one oxide. The nitrogen one oxide comes from this. If, if oxygen, just say if oxygen's minus two, what would nitrogen be? Plus, in order to add up to zero. If oxygen is minus two, then each nitrogen would be what? And so in other words, two times x, I don't need the parentheses, I guess, plus minus two, is equal to zero. What is x? X is going to be positive one. And so that, that's why we call it nitrogen one oxide. NO is nitric oxide. Have you heard of nitric oxide boosters? Nitric oxide is an important, um, important chemical regulating blood flow. And um, in, in fact, even during COVID, blood clotting was a big issue. So people were trying nitric oxide therapy to see if that could alleviate some of the clotting issues that people were having. Um, nitric oxide is important, what they call a messenger, biological messenger molecule. And so there are a lot of supplements out there that claim to boost nitric oxide levels. Nitric oxide won molecule of the year not so long ago. Hmm? That's a thing, yeah. You might not be aware of molecule of the year. <clears throat> what? I'm sorry? Yeah, right. Right. Um, also, the well, not only did it win mo molecule of the year, it won molecule of the year quite a while ago. Let's see what it is. 
I forgot what year it was. This is Science Magazine. Science Magazine is, Science and, and Nature Magazine are the premier scientific journals in the world. But here, ta-da, the molecule of the year is nitric oxide, a molecule of versatility and importance that has burst onto the scene in many guises. In the atmosphere, it is a noxious chemical. In the atmosphere, we don't want to breathe it because nitric oxide is poisonous. Well, up to a point. But in the body, in small controlled doses, it has extraordinarily, it is extraordinarily beneficial. It helps maintain blood pressure by dilating blood vessels, helps kill foreign invaders in the immune response, is a major biochemical mediator. Oh, anyway. Um, so, any, so Science Magazine, it is, uh, important, but it's poisonous, it's toxic. So we don't want this. Nitric oxide coming out of the exhaust is part of NOx. And so if your car spits out too much NO, it's not going to pass your smog test. But that's not the only one. There are a whole bunch of oxides of nitrogen. That's why we call them NOx, because X is a variable. And so the other ones would be NO2. What would you call this one? Just take a guess. Nitric oxide is also called, I, I forgot to write this down, nitrogen monoxide. NO2 is nitrogen dioxide. We don't have another fancy name. We have we use nitrous here and we use nitric. Now we've run out of it. You know, I guess we could use per, but we don't have that for this case. So this is the one's called nitrogen dioxide. Now, do we have nitrogen trioxide? Uh, well, nitrogen dioxide ha has another name. Um, let's go back to nitric oxide. Another name for nitric oxide is nitrogen. Now, imagine oxygen is minus two. What would that make nitrogen? So if oxygen is minus two, nitrogen must be positive two in order to add up to zero. So we call this nitrogen Roman numeral two oxide. What is the charge on oxide usually? Not peroxide, but oxide. Negative two. What's another name for nitrogen dioxide? If, if oxygen is minus two and we have two of them, that would be two times minus two gives us minus four. And that may, must mean that nitrogen must be plus four in order to balance out the charge. So what I write is nitrogen, Roman numeral four, oxide. Um, how about NO3? This one should be easy. This one should be called nitrogen trioxide. Or give me another name for nitrogen trioxide. Okay, if oxide is minus 2, that means mu nitrogen must be plus 6. So we call this nitrogen Six, Roman numeral space oxide. Um, nitrogen trioxide doesn't form. Why? Nitrogen, it would be highly un unstable if it became a six. Why, why is that?
What is the range of charge for nitrogen? Negative three to no positive five. Could you do that? You got that? Only two people got it, or are there more? Anybody else get it? Just two. Um. Spencer or Wahez, can you explain how you got it? Yeah. The, the, the range spans eight. The, we're talking about the patterns in the periodic table. That's one of the patterns. But there's another way of doing it. The other way of doing it is by looking at 10 and 2. What's special about 10 and 2? What's, there's something special about 10 and 2. Helium and neon. Helium and neon are very stable. And so, um, so if you're uh, nitrogen, how can you get from 7 to 10? Because 7 to 10, we can't change the number of protons, but we can change the number of electrons. And so if we go from this, because nitrogen has, if we look at it, it has seven protons, seven electrons, and a variable number of neutrons, depending on which isotope of nitrogen we're looking at. So if we want to go from seven electrons to ten electrons, how many do you have to add? If you want to go from seven electrons to ten electrons, how many electrons do you have to add to nitrogen? Three. And each nitrogen has what charge? I mean, zero, but each electron has what charge? Negative. So if you add three electrons, you're adding three negative charges to zero, and that's going to make it nitride. It's going to make it N3 minus. And so nitrogen would like to gain three electrons to go up to 10. Fluorine wants to gain how many? Does it want to gain three electrons? It just wants to gain one electron to get to 10. Oxygen wants to gain two. So all these are minus one, all these are minus two, all these are minus three. But that's only one charge possible. There are multiple charges that are possible depending on what happens in the reaction. And those would be the common charges of these monatomic ions. Minus 1 for the, minus 2 for this, minus 3 for this, minus 4 for this. But when we get to minus 5, it's becoming less and less stable. Even minus 4 is a bit much to get. But the other possibility is rather than um, gaining, like boron, you know, boron would have to gain how many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It would be much easier for boron to lose. And so if we lose three, then we could be at helium. And so there's a possibility of gaining or losing electrons. Does that make any sense at all? If it doesn't make any sense, then all you do is you just memorize the pattern. You don't worry about if it makes sense or if it doesn't make sense. Because what, what's better? What's better is at least being able to do something versus being able to do nothing. If you go, that doesn't make sense, I'm not even going to bother with that. And then you, you're hit with something like this. On the test, you know, you can still figure it out just by knowing the pattern. You, you know, a lot of these patterns people have unexplained. Like I was, watching, uh, I was watching another alien video, and they're talking about these unexplained patterns, you know, with these, that they had these videos. But, you know, you can see the pattern. If you see the pattern, you can still use the pattern, and you don't have to necessarily know what it's about. And so you don't get hung up. This is just simple addition and subtraction. And everybody can do addition and subtraction, right? You know, if you're at 7, to get to 10, you've got to add 3. To get to 2, you have to lose 5. 
if you lose five electrons, then it was neutral, and now you lost five electrons. Now the protons and electrons in balance, what's the charge? No, it was zero, but it was zero because you had seven. Uh, maybe I, I need to write this down. Any talking doesn't quite do it here. 